Hello. Eagle eyes are strange. Is this better? Okay. Is this recorded? Oh, all right, cool. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Clinton Isham. I'm from uh, Lac the Flambeau Ojibwe tribe, which is in northern Wisconsin. And um, I work for the American for Non Smokers Rights Foundation, which is housed out of Berkeley, California. Um, live in Chicago. And um, ANR does a bunch of work with uh, different. Uh, smoke-free campaigns around different states and cities and um, increasingly growing within uh, tribal communities. Um, I used to work, um, I used to work with um, the Great Lakes Intertribal Council as the Wisconsin Native American Tobacco Network for several years before I started working with ANR. And we worked with the, the 11 tribes in Wisconsin providing uh, cessation, uh, tobacco cessation support and also helping modify work plans for uh, tribal um, policy work within individual tribes in Wisconsin, which there are 11. And um, right away through, at my, through my role at uh, Great Lakes Intertribal Council at Winnaton, I realized you know, how important this work truly is um, and that um, it really, I mean, it, there's an urgency for this type of work specifically in tribal communities um, because of the health disparities mainly, um, meaning that um, American Indians and Alaskan Natives have the highest um, commercial uh, to tobacco use rate for smoking. Um, we have the highest, nope, okay. Oh no, I'm gonna do a thumbs up. <laughs> um, we have the highest uh, we have the highest cancer rates um, compared to any group uh, or ethnicity um, in cancers related to smoking and secondhand smoke. And we also have the highest cancer mortality rates compared to any group or ethnicity, um, just meaning that we die at much higher levels compared to um, other people from um, from diseases and cancers linked to uh, smoking and secondhand smoke. So. Um, it's really important, and I learned that there are several ways, different approaches to to kind of do this type of work in tribal communities. And I think what we're aware of when we write grants for the state and different uh, federal uh, funders, we um, we think of terms like um, I know that you said this conference is called best practices or like proven strategies. 
and these these are like conventional methods that sometimes um they they work in a community like it's proven to work in one community and um funders say okay let's kind of do that over in this community or in this community because it's worked in this community so these conventional approaches um sometimes don't work in a lot of tribal communities and it takes um you know multiple different ways to figure things out in order to be successful in tribal tobacco policy work and prevention work within individual tribes so it's like um not one equation solves each problem um so and this is this is the case specifically with tobacco because tobacco use and tobacco in general is very complex in Indian country. Um, there are a lot of tribes that have tobacco use um, in their creation stories, or they have, um, or some tribes don't have it in their stories at all. Um, a lot of uh, tribal communities. Um, well, they, because of land loss and because of colonization, we don't have direct access to traditional tobacco use. But a lot of tribes, you know, at the same time do use ceremonial tobacco and tobacco for ceremonial purposes. But sometimes we have to use commercial tobacco for that. And so there's just a lot of gray area in between all of that. And so it's a complex issue. And through my work with, you know, different tribes um, around Wisconsin and working with other colleagues out of Minnesota, mainly through like Clearway. Um, I've learned right away that um, our goal is in this line of work is not to eliminate tobacco use in Indian country, right? That, that's not our goal. Our goal is to decolonize tobacco, which um, includes uh, ending commercial tobacco use in Indian country and at the same time repatriating tobacco into our communities, meaning taking our traditional tobacco back and making sure that it's um, that the it's used the way it's supposed to be used in our communities. Um, so I'm going to share a lot of videos throughout this presentation, and um, we could start with this video. And it's around uh, our work with decolonizing tobacco and sharing uh, some successful things that um, some some successful approaches in this line of work um, throughout different communities in Wisconsin. When I was growing up, I only knew tobacco to be used in one way, and that was commercial tobacco, smoking cigarettes. Once I stopped smoking, I really started to seek out the other side of tobacco. Learning more about that transformation that took place from medicine for our people to be used to this very destructive thing that kills our people now. And when I started to learn more about traditional tobacco use, I started to realize that it's possible for anyone to change their perspective on tobacco. My name is Clinton Isham. I'm the program director for the Wisconsin Native American Tobacco Network. My main focus is to change the norm that our communities have built around commercial tobacco. The Indian Bowl is an event center that's been around since the 1950s here in Lac de Flambeau and is going to be completely smoke free. This is a decision that was made by the board of directors, mainly working with Tinker Schumann and Georgine Brown. Our plan is to work with arena directors, the MCs, different drumming groups, the different dancers that come in to get the message out when people are coming into the Indian Bowl itself. We work closely with tribal leaders around smoke-free policies or different health initiatives. What we try to do is make sure that initiatives are as successful as possible and provide any type of support that we can. One example is the Madison Ho-Chunk Gaming Casino going smoke-free. For quite some time, I was getting comment cards regarding our smoking. Love the place, we love playing here. You got great service, you have fantastic machines. Can't stand the smoke. So I decided that we should look at the possibility of going smoke free and came to discover that what was traditionally recognized in gaming, 70% of the players smoke. Our survey really revealed a complete opposite, that really 30% of our players smoked. 
I also took a look at a study that had been conducted called Gambling With Our Health, and not only would this gaming facility not lose revenue, but in fact, going forward, it would, it would actually gain revenue. We decided that this is something that we needed to do in order for us to provide for a better place for our employees and for our guests. We certainly saw a, a decrease in our revenues for about 10 months, but we stayed the course. We've recovered fully. In fact, we're doing better than we were prior to going smoke-free. The comments from our patrons, overwhelmingly supportive. Love your place. Love how clean it is. Love how it smells. You know, just love playing in a place that I don't have to, to breathe somebody else's smoke. When we were smoking, we were constantly working in clouds of smoke. You'd go home and it'd be in your hair, be in your clothes, you'd wash it and it would still smell. We had employees, even though they didn't smoke at home, they'd come to work and they would still have quite a few health issues just being in the environment. We went smoke-free and our employees, obviously their health impact is, it's been huge for them. They're not having to breathe in that smoke every single day, all night long. Any native casino that goes smoke-free, I think sends a really strong message to its community. It shows the concern for the folks that are in that facility, and I think that same concern should carry over into the rest of the community in general, that public buildings should be smoke-free. These different local coalitions and individuals are doing really great work to address the impact that commercial tobacco has, trying to go back to reclaiming our tobacco. Long time ago, when I was taught how to grow it and how to take care of it, I understood that in our creation story, the grandmother, when she came down to this earth, one of the things that grew from her feet was this Indian tobacco. We've always used that tobacco to say prayers when we have our ceremonies. When I started learning about tobacco, I realized that our, our community needed tobacco. Throughout Native American country, it's not available because we've lost so many of our ways. So many of our songs, our dances, our ceremonies, our traditions. And so it's a matter of trying to encourage people to grow this. The bottom line is this originally came from the Creator's land. It's considered our medicine that takes care of our people for all the healing that we have to do. So this Indian tobacco and these seeds I have right here are going to keep on growing. Seven generations past me, they'll still be able to say, my great, 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 great grandmother grew this. And we still have our ceremonies and our songs and our dances and our medicines because she cared enough, because she loved us enough to keep on growing it. we have a different relationship with tobacco. And so it's important to create policies that respect that ideology of tobacco. And that's exactly what the Madison Casino did, the Indian Bowl did, and it really sends a strong message to Native communities that it's possible to create policy that works for our people. Our focus is 10 or 15 years from now when we ask a kid, what does tobacco mean to you? They don't you know, say it's cigarette smoking. It's more about traditional tobacco use and what it means to them to put out tobacco in the morning for prayer and how they're using that tobacco to overcome different challenges. We go to the next slide. <clears throat> so um, that video is done in 2000 and. 16 and put out in 2017 and we'll talk about ho-chunk gaming madison soon but they were the first um casino to go smoke free in the midwest or tribal casino to go smoke free in the midwest and um they did the whole promotion around public health with it and it's just really amazing and um a lot of tribal casinos that i'm gonna be talking about in this presentation they every single one of them used um, this example through Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison is a roadmap to implement their own policies. So Dan Brown and Kyla, they were like very instrumental in this whole thing that um, took place during the pandemic. And um, even now with a lot of uh, different 
comprehensive smoke-free policies that tribes have passed. Um, a lot of that is due to um, Dan Brown and Kyla that um, run the Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison Casino. And Dan is still there. There's, um, I'll just talk about this now. There's six tribal casino, there's six Ho-Chunk Gaming Casinos in Wisconsin. And um, Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison became the flagship casino after about a year of being smoke-free. Um, and it was, um, outperform it was over it was outperforming all of their other casinos um even the one in wisconsin dells which is this huge resort area that um was their flagship casino for so long and because they went smoke free they saw a huge uptick in revenue and we'll talk about stuff like that too because um, we've done surveys around this and i have lots of information about that um so just in general a lot of this work is like i said it's around decolonizing tobacco and um, the path of decolonizing tobacco is, is just, is, it's really just around education, right? And it requires us, and it requires us to be, to, to be equipped to, um, to, to teach and to learn um, different components of history, culture, and sovereignty, those three things. It's so important in everything that we do in our work plans and um, our presentations and things that we do for communities that we um, help educate around those three things, because um, you know, for example, for history, if we understand the history of tobacco and the transformation that took place with tobacco, we would know better not to use uh, campaigns like this in our tribal communities that say no tobacco and tobacco is bad because tobacco is not bad in our tribal communities, right? Something different. We, we have to um, tailor the message uh, according to different uh, histories of tribal communities. So if that community has, um, if tobacco is important to that community, then we create uh, different um, measures or um, tools for implementing policies that say no commercial tobacco instead, and that traditional tobacco is allowed. Um, and so we use this type of language and policies when we understand different components of history. Um, Oh, sorry. Next slide. Okay. And then, so um, teaching culture, this is like, like not teaching culture, but um, just helping people be aware of different cultural differences across tribal communities is one of my favorite things to do. Um, my job, I, I, I create resources for tribal communities looking to pass policies. And so, um, something I get to do is I get to go to tribal communities all over the U.S. and spend time with people and conduct interviews. And my favorite way to, um, to help spread that message of different cultural components within communities is, um, is through short story videos. Um, as you see in the video earlier um, in Wisconsin, I didn't produce that video, but I helped had a big part in it. And it, that really helped me like want to get into sharing videos and doing videos on my own. So through a and um, I've helped with a lot of different uh, community videos. And something that's important about these videos is that when you know, we're conducting interviews and talking to different community members, um, they, they know what the community needs, right? It's like, it's their voice is the power. Their voice is the key to what needs to happen next. And so if you listen to what they're saying, you know, these are the types of things that we have to include like in our work plans or in our in, in different grants that we write for and things like that moving forward and especially in policy language. Um, and so this is a quick uh, video, you can press play on this. And it's just a video that I did with uh, a lady named Virginia Chosa, who lives in a multi-unit housing complex in on a tribal reservation that allows smoking. The way people are brought up here, they tell you what you have to do when we did it. But it is not good to have smoking in buildings anymore. I like to find we should have all housing smoke free. We got some elders in here, we got children in here, and um, uh, animals, and, and you know, and uh, all can be affected by smoking. It really comes into my apartment bad, and um, I said, Oh my god, there must be smoking right out my door because it just comes in waves and waves of, of smoke through the, through the cracks and the uh, doors and, uh, and uh, I think I, I mentioned it to a former uh, uh, manager over there at, at the housing supervisor 
Uh, so I, I might have mentioned it there, but I always complain to all the workers all the time because they have to clean up the apartments and they're all, they have to repaint them. Some, some they have to take down the walls because they're so bad. They're so full of smoke. They have to um, re gut buildings now because of smoking. have to come out there and tell them that it's deadly, which it is. It is deadly and more people are getting cancer from it and uh, the smoking is, is bad, bad here. Thank you. You can go to the next slide. So Virginia, Virginia is a tribal um, elder in Lac de Flambeau and she has COPD. She's on an oxygen tank. She carries it everywhere with her. And um, she lives in a complex, a housing complex that allows smoking. And she petitions the tribe and asks for policies to get changed. And um, she's she's an awesome tribal leader. I love working with her and she's still around and she still lives in um, that multi-unit multi housing complex. And um, in order, I mean, to, to, to changing policy within tribes, it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, and, you know, that's just one example of how hard it really could be. You know, we have a tribal leader and elder that's asking for these different types of policies. And um, it's so hard to get these things, you know, passed within tribal councils. And um, to the, it's very difficult, um, but it's, it's, it's possible too, it's possible. Um, so the path, you know, continuing to talk about the path to decolonizing tobacco and, and uh, being empowered to uh, learn and educate around uh, culture and history. Um, sovereignty is another component that will help um, tremendously in this work, um, especially if you're looking to change or help change policy within tribal communities. Um, sovereignty is like key. It's key to everything. Understanding this and understanding it within different tribal communities and what it means to them. Um, do you guys wanna, um, what is tribal sovereignty to you guys? Does anybody wanna help answer that? What tribal sovereignty means, definition of it? Emily, go. Okay. Very good. Man, that is that, that, yes, exactly. Anybody else? So um, those are two great examples and yeah, exactly. That's how I think of it too. It's, you know, tribal leaders, they create policy in order to in order to ensure that their future generations have their language, have their food, have their medicines, have land, have resources, have different things that um, to ensure that these things are passed down into future generations. And so it's really important to, um, to be aware of, of that, that process in general and to be aware of um, you know, what is specifically important within different tribal communities and what were the decisions that were made you know, past, present, and future that that um, that helps pass those things along to future generations. What do tribal leaders decide to do? What what is important to to tribal leaders? This is a map right here of um, the state of Wisconsin, and this is on the ways.org. The website is called, and um, these are the original um, boundary lines within different tribes. So this was all Ojibwe land, right? This was all Menominee land right here. Um, this was all Potawatomi land. And these are the different reservations that are in Wisconsin now today. There's a total of 11 different uh, tribes and you know multiple reservations that are spread all over the place. Um, so looking at this map, um, looking at this map and wondering um, what decisions tribal leaders made before colonization and, um, and during colonization in order to ensure that 
their people would survive. And so, for example, it said that in um, before colonization, the Ojibwe tribe, that we migrated from the east so that we, we were at one point from the east coast. And there was a story of a boy who found a scroll and the scroll was uh, a prophecy that said that we needed to migrate uh, west in order to find food where food grows on water. And so the Ojibwe people, tribal leaders, they gathered all their people, right? And they told everybody that we need to start migrating west. And so we made it all the way up to uh, the Great Lakes region. And this is the first, this is the last stop that we made it to right here is Madeline Island. And, um, and that's where we found where the food grows on water. It's wild rice, which is an endemic um, uh, species of uh, rice that's only found in the Great Lakes region. And um, so our people made these decisions, um, you know, a long time ago um, to, to ensure our survival um, and into um, in so our communities. There's there's it's, it's so important to um, to to make those types of decisions. Um, so, sorry. So at some point. At some point, um, all of this different land, right? Like this, there was decisions made that made this an entire Ojibwe territory and this an entire Menominee territory. And during the 19th century, when, it, when uh, settlers started coming in more and more into Wisconsin, um, tribal leaders went into land session agreements with the United States government. So they had to make decisions um, in order for their people to survive um, and so what they did was they sold huge, huge tracts of land for smaller and smaller um, areas that we went to. And so this is just one example of a treaty. This is like the, the original boundary of the Ojibwe people that was established in the Treaty of Prairie du Chien. It's a whole other story. But um, like during 19, there was three different land session treaties uh, specifically with the Ojibwe people that made our land base smaller and smaller and smaller. And then finally, until um, we were on reservations like that. And so all of these were around decisions that tribal leaders made in order for our people to survive. And um, I'm only bringing this up. Oh, you could go to the next slide. I'm only bringing this up because um, it's so important to understand these things when you want to be effective in working with tribal gaming. Um, you have to know what sovereignty is. You have to know um, different treaties within the communities. Um, and you just have to have a basic understanding of these types of things because um, it's so important uh, within, within uh, especially within tribal gaming. Um, you go to the next slide. Um, do you guys know where this is? Connecticut. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, Foxwoods. It's Foxwoods Casino. So um, going back to my point in the, the last slide, the last thing you want to do is um, go into an area or tribal headquarters like this and tell them what they're doing is wrong and tell them that, hey, um, you need to change your policy because you're doing something wrong, right? They're, they 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 don't care. They're gonna do. They're gonna continue doing what they're doing, success because they're successful and they're good at it. They have they have a strategy down, and they know they know the tribal leaders there. They know what is best for their community. They're not gonna come in and listen to me or anybody trying to, um, you know, impact what they're doing. Um, do you guys know if this is a smoke free casino? You go to the next slide. So Foxwoods is a smoke-free casino. We have a list um, where we uh, kind of track the different um, casinos that are smoke-free. Like I said in the beginning of the presentation, Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison in 2015 was one of the first smoke-free casinos in the Midwest. During the pandemic, um, a lot of casinos, in, as you guys know, you know, businesses and entities everywhere shut down for um, a brief amount of time. And um, casinos, tribal casinos, because of sovereignty and because um, they needed their casinos to remain open, they were the first entities to reopen their doors among 
all other businesses and you know other entities in the United States. And um, tribal leaders, they got together and they said, okay, we're going to um, we're going to reopen our doors as a safe the safest way possible. And so they created measures to help protect their patrons and their staff. And those measures included um, limiting uh, capacity, uh, temperature checks, wearing masks, of course, and also over 160 uh, casinos throughout the United States went smoke free. And it was just really cool to see because uh, tribal leaders were, um, they were like on the front line and and people were coming to tribal leaders to see how these changes were working within their establishments, right? Like there was no other businesses open besides tribal casinos. And they had um, all these different uh, COVID-19 measures in place. And it was just really cool to see. And something that we did at a &R, um, rather than, um, you know, going into tribes, like I said, and telling them what they need to do and um, telling them that they need to be smoke free, we were um, doing our best to highlight the 160 casinos that did go smoke free. So we were um, we, we, we sent them awards and um, we just highlighted them on Facebook and different uh, uh, things of social media. We were on a lot of webinars and we talked about them. And um, it was just really cool because like during that time, um, there was a lot of attention on tribal casinos and um, there was like this shift from casinos, tribal casinos, you know, when you think of tribal casinos or casinos in general, you think of like dark, smoky, you know, dirty kind of places. But there was this like really awesome shift that took place where tribal casinos um, wanted to be kind of considered and known as healthy, safe, bright, fun places. And so we, our job uh, was to help kind of create that image and share that that was the case within a lot of tribal casinos. Have you guys been into a smoke-free casino after it was, um, bef I mean, a smoking casino and, uh, you know, before the pandemic? And then uh, what were some of the, like the big changes or noticeable changes that you've seen? Okay. Oh, cool. Yep. Very cool. Okay. Well, yeah, there's, there's things that casinos, they know what to do in order to be considered a smoking casino, or if there's like smoke free laws within a state for commercial casinos, they know ways around to allow smoking still while obeying the law. It's really cool. There's a lot of examples that I could go through that are like that. Um, um, so, oh, a big, a big thing that I've noticed with casinos, mainly um, from visiting casinos while they were smoking to then visiting casinos that didn't allow smoking was the lights. It was really crazy. Like it seems brighter in casinos and obviously they didn't change anything with the lights. Right. Cause I think casinos just feel kind of like dark, but if you go into smoke free casinos, just see if you notice that it just seems a lot brighter. And um, it was really cool to, to, um, kind of yeah yes yeah yes right yeah maybe it had something to do with like the residue on the on the uh the plastic parts of the lights and stuff like that um so a big question that i get this around this time like in 2020 and 2021 was how do we um how do we make casinos be permanently smoke free so a lot of casinos um, implemented temporary policies through um, their casinos as part of like COVID-19 measures. So how do we uh, create policies that are permanent within 
tribes, tribal governments. Do um, you guys know what we do? It's a trick question. We don't do nothing because we don't have a say in any tribe and uh, the decisions that tribal leaders make. We can't, there's, <laughs> there's nothing that we can do. As far as going into a tribe and telling them, hey, you should make your casino permanently smoke free. Um, the best thing that we can do is work with different health coalitions that are already existing within tribal communities. Um, this is, we work closely with the Airs Life um, Air's Life Health Coalition in Navajo Nation. They've been trying to pass a comprehensive smoke-free bill on the Navajo Nation for over 18 years. And it finally took a pandemic for uh, Dr. Patricia Nez Henderson and Herschel and a group of others to, um, to reintroduce the legislation into the Navajo Nation, which finally passed last year in 2021. And um, it was really amazing, but there was tons of work that was done um, within the coalition and this policy really would not have been successful if it wasn't for like, you know, uh, calls twice a week with the coalition and um, just coming up with different ideas on how to be successful in passing the Air's Life Act. Oh, next slide. Um, another example is um, Eastern Band Cherokee Indians. Um, they, were, they were temporarily smoke free um, after, after reopening um, their casinos during COVID-19. And um, their casino saw this huge uptick in revenue, like record-breaking revenue uh, every month. And um, their tribal members, um, it's, this is all public information. Their tribal members get, I think, a quarterly stipend or a quarterly per cap from the casino. And um, their per caps were raised by like two, $3,000 because of the casino was doing so well during the pandemic. And the one thing that changed within this casino was it being smoke free. So we had um, some community members contact us and they wanted to um, introduce the legislation to create a permanent smoke free um, Harris Eastern Band Cherokee Indian Casino. And so um, we did some videos, like I said, we did some videos, um, we helped with some different resources. We bought some of these signs and we placed them throughout the community. And um, they also passed a policy um, within their community. It was like three months after the Air is Life Act had passed. And um, it was really cool. We could press play on this. This is just a video that I did with with the community member. And use the Fire Mountain bike trails or go to the National Park and visit the village. My name is Tamara Thompson and I'm from the Big Cove community and a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in Cherokee, North Carolina. I'm currently a table game supervisor at the casino, the Harris Cherokee property. Before the pandemic, it was, you know, a very big party atmosphere, you know, drinking, smoking, gaming. It was like the trinity, the trifecta. <laughs> After the pandemic, we still feel like it's a party atmosphere, but there's no smoking and it's fantastic. We have broken all projections. We have had record breaking quarters and this is all during non-smoking. <laughs> Younger people, they want the glam. They want to, you know, they want to be in a, a very posh setting and without smoking, now you can really get into a better atmosphere and younger people are like, okay, now I want to go there. This is not, you know, a smog, filled, smoke filled casino. Now we can go and we can breathe and we can, <laughs> you know, have a good time and not come back home freaking. I think they can market this as a destination area to be outside, but also for conferences. You have people who attend conferences who can use the Fire Mountain bike trails or go to the National Park and visit the village and go to all these places, but the casino can be part that of that and they here. can remain healthy in doing so by not being exposed to the smoke. I think it's a great marketing tool. I'm Angie Lewis. I'm a first descendant of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. My mom is a enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. I mean, you've got, you know, 80% of, of individuals now are not smokers. And I, I think that it's, it's a very small thing to ask people to step outside or to go to an, a special area for smoking. Detached from the main floor to where patrons do not smell it when they come in. Smoking 
has been a barrier to a lot of, of tourism in Cherokee at the casino once people would go up there and, and smell the smoke. And I know that, it, that sometimes it's minimized in conversation. It's a lingering thing that we just need to put our foot down and say no to. Tribal Council has the ultimate responsibility to keep everybody safe and to, to make it better for all families, not just the employees, not just the ones that go to the casino, because it impacts everybody. It impacts our healthcare system. You all thank us every time we have a per capita distribution. I hear endless platitudes like, thank you casino workers for the blessings that you've given to this tribe. But when it comes down to it, if you really want to thank us, you'd protect us. You would protect our health and protect the health of our families and the financial health of the tribe by keeping our facilities smoke free. You know, thank yous only go so far, but what we really need are, are safe working environments. Um, <clears throat> you go to the next slide. So uh, Eastern Band Cherokee Indians had a legislation that created um, all of their existing sites. Uh, we're gonna have to look at future sites because I know they're expanding into Virginia. They're having another casino open, but um, they had three different sites, um, two are in um, North Carolina. And so currently all of their casinos, the brick and mortar casinos are smoke-free and they have to remain smoke-free uh, permanently. Um, so our job is, is really just to work with these coalitions and to help provide TA and other types of resources, whatever types of resources that these communities need. Big thing that's helped um, with a lot of communities, including Eastern Band and Ayers Life, is conducting uh, patron surveys that we've, de that we've developed. And the coalition will go out and um, survey uh, a number of people in their community and then bring back the results to their tribal council showing over and over again, um, this is data across the board right now that um, people prefer smoke-free gaming, smokers prefer smoke-free gaming. And um, so this is uh, data like this. It's so important to show it to your tribal leaders if you're looking to go in this route because um, a lot of tribal leaders and I think especially casino managers, they're going to say that um, that gambling plus smoking equals more money like that is that was the narrative for so, so long, um, in which is it's not true. Right? It's not true anymore. You go to the next slide. Um, we could go past. I know I only got like five or 10 minutes left, I think you go to the next. OK, right here. Um, and uh, another thing that we have on our ANR uh, website for coalitions that are looking to introduce policy um, or are, are already in the process is tons of different resources around how to create a policy. Uh, we work with the Public Health Law Center very closely in uh, developing different templates for casinos to just adopt within their casinos. Then we have tons of different, um, you know, new data that show that um, people prefer smoke-free gaming. You go to the next slide. Oh, um, and so in, in also um, we just provide different types of resources like signs and we help develop these different signs. It's really cool working with the Navajo Nation. Um, so they're very remote within the Southwest region and they rely on this radio station for a lot of their news and especially like before social media, KTNN radio um, reaches like over 250,000 people in the Navajo Nation or the surrounding area around the Navajo Nation. So what we did um, several times was we did a lot of different um, like webinars, like we would do webinars, me and Airs Life Coalition, and they would have me like splice all these different audio pieces so that it sounds like a radio forum for a whole hour. And we would send these to KTNN and, you know, Air's Life would pay them, but um, it would sound like a live stream, like we're on the radio talking. And it was really cool because um, we worked really closely together, um, me and uh, Herschel Clark, to kind of develop this. And it was really just like spending, you know, countless hours uh, splicing different audio clips and making sure that 
they it sounded like it was this continuous conversation for a whole hour um and we tried to have conversations like that so we wouldn't do that and it it never worked out you go to the next slide um and then uh important uh on that topic um just disseminating information so trying to uh, reach people is it either through social media or different radio forums um a really effective way that a lot of coalitions um have done during the pandemic especially for for smoke free gaming is just hosting webinars and so um a lot of times it'd be like a health coalition or a clinic and um they would um host a webinar and try to get the surrounding area to um to join the webinar and to join the conversation and we'd have you know some people from gaming or you know public health people just talk about why it's important and um, we used Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison tons of times. We asked Dan Brown to participate on our webinars and he would come on and, you know, talk about why smoke-free gaming is important and how it's helped the Ho-Chunk Gaming Madison Casino. So this has been really an uh, effective way of, of um, I guess, reaching people that um, are kind of, that are, that don't know much about uh, smoke-free gaming right now. You go to the next one. Um, we could go past this. This is, um, I'll just talk about this video. These videos are on my presentation and I think all the links are attached on here too. But, um, this is a video that we did around the final Air's Life Act. And, um, I think petition, petitioning tribes for change, that kind of, it feels like encroaching on sovereignty, right? Like your if tribes don't want to do something, then, um, you petition them like through change.org. I don't know, I've done it in, uh, on the behalf of the community. Like if the community is requesting these types of things and they're unable to reach their tribal leaders, um, I've helped with different types of peti petitions. And the one thing that we did, um, what's really cool with Navajo Nation is that they have all their council meetings on Facebook and on YouTube and they're live streamed. And so, um, man, it was really cool. And I, a part of being a council member on Navajo, you need to know the language. And so, we had um we knew that um there was there there was somebody um what's the word called lobbying for the casino to remain smoking at Navajo Nation um because there was a white paper that was circulating within tribal council members and so when they were in the middle of discussing um the Heirs Life Act and considering passing it or not um we we started going on um YouTube and in putting comments in the comment boxes. And we had people from all over the country flood the comment boxes on YouTube and on Facebook and trying to communicate with the leaders to, to have them kind of vote for smoke-free gaming. And they caught on, it's really cool because they caught on and they started switching into speaking only Navajo when they talked about smoke-free gaming so that we couldn't understand and we couldn't like go out to the community or people on Facebook and tell them to comment on stuff. So we had to um, have a translator like with us at the coalition all the time to translate different pieces of uh, when Navajo leaders were discussing the Heirs Life Act. And it was just really cool and it was a different way of uh, petitioning for policy change, I guess. And um, this video shows kind of that process and it was really fun. We go to the next slide. Okay, um, this is the last slide. Um, I think the bottom line in uh, our work in decolonizing tobacco and the things that we're trying to do is to take back our tobacco, right? Like that is the end goal. Um, our tobacco, traditional tobacco, it's um, it's something. It's very sacred, and the intent there was an intent for tobacco. It was to give thanks and, uh, and to offer it to Creator and for prayer different things like that so there was an intent with our tobacco it was taken and it was appropriated for something completely different so the intent of our tobacco and the definition the the what is in our tobacco has completely changed and transformed um this is we're talking about treaties or looking at different treaties and earlier this presentation this is one of the first treaties that was ever uh, made in the United States. It was in the 1700s, um, and it was given to the Dutch by the Haudenosaunee Nation, and um, it's a two-row wampum belt. 
and um, Warren Lyons always talks about this wampum belt. I always love listening to him speak. But what this wampum belt is, is um, the, um, the Haudenosaunee people gave it to the Dutch and said, okay, this represents two rivers, right? Um, this river is what we're on. And we're going down it on, uh, and throughout our life. And this is the river that you're on right here. Each of us will um, have our own language, have our own culture, um, have our own lifestyles, and we won't, we won't um, intervene with one another. In this river of life, we're just going to, um, to travel down it in our separate ways. And so something that happened with tobacco is that um, it was taken and it transformed into something else. It got mixed up. And, and, um, and because of that, it has had profound effects and impacts on our people, right? And um, instead of being this provider of life and thanks and, and sustenance, it's now something that kills our people. And so what we need to do with our tobacco and you know, petitioning tribal uh, um, um, casinos and doing this work with different health coalitions and learning things around history, culture, and sovereignty, um, what we need to do is, uh, is put tobacco back on our, our canoe, our boat, and to make sure that it, it's not lost again so that its original intent to go back into our communities and help heal our communities and help our communities get to uh, where we need to go. That's it. Thank you. I was much more nervous when you came in. <laughs>